the organizer by CIAI, the Center of Integrative Artificial Intelligence. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Eric and Professor Kipakri for their support. I'm very excited to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Danilo Zizende. Uh, Danilo is a senior staff researcher and the leader of the generative models and inference group at DeepMind London. To make it very short, he was trained as a physicist at Eco Polytechnic and is also a very well-known expert in machine learning, especially in generative models and approximate inference. And more importantly, he has been focusing on advancing sciences, including physics, uh, from an artificial intelligence perspective. And today, um, we will talk about, one second, the information. Then we will talk about generative models, manifolds and symmetries from QFT to uh, molecules. So Daniel, uh, whenever you're ready, please. So it's so nice to have you here. Thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, I'm really happy to be giving this talk and to have some discussions afterwards. Um, can you see my slides already? No, right now, no. no. Okay, let me, let Previously, me, I saw it. Let me share my windows. This. Uh, just uh, uh, just a, se a second, apologies. Uh, apologies, uh, there's some um, um, authorities uh, permission uh, things. Um, in the meanwhile, while we are waiting, so essentially we care about AI uh, for science, right? And today you are going to see a wonderful talk uh, on this topic, covering also other subjects. And in deep learning, uh, Daniel also published a very well-known and influential uh, papers, right? including um, papers on normalizing flows and so on. Oh. Previously, I saw, I saw it. Could you try to see? Where yes, there see? is. Um, apologies for this delay. There is some uh, permission issue uh, appearing on my side. Let me try again. Mm -hmm. Cool. Wonderful. Yeah, you can see the slides. Yeah. By the way, uh, no, Daniel, you are on mute. You are on mute. And uh, by the. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Uh, now it's good. And by the way, you can see uh, some students in the classroom, but most people are online. So we have a lot of participants. Please. No, I cannot. Could you try again? No, I cannot. Oh. Some people say yes. Could you could you try again? Exactly. Uh, thanks, uh, Mohammed. Yeah. Um, thanks, Tim. Yeah. No. Oh, I, I can hear you now. Then you know, I can hear you. It looks like every time I share a tab, uh, the audio gets uh, I get muted for some reason. Uh, 
by the way, oh, sorry, mm -hmm. uh, everyone. We tried to come to the room earlier, but uh, this link was not available. So we were talking uh, in my Zoom meeting room. That's why we didn't test it out beforehand. I'm sorry for that. Um, yeah, you can try again. Um, I, I, I found the problem. Um, Okay, while we are waiting, uh, let me say a few words about, about uh, background. So you can see essentially Daniel's background is very interesting, right? Um, he was uh, really trained to be a professional physicist. And then he became a very well-known expert in uh, machine learning, especially modeling machine learning. And uh, right now he's trying very hard to uh, study phys physical problems and other problems in science uh, with AI. So essentially, this is the one of the. Oh, oh. Hello, uh, can you see my slides and hear me now? Yes, please. Very good, thank you. Apologies, my sincere apologies for that. Uh, I had some uh, uh, browser authorization issue, but uh, if you can see the slides, I can start right now. Yes, and, uh, perfect. So again, thank you very much for this invitation. I'm very happy to talk about the work we've been doing over the last uh, few years. As you can see from the title, it ranges from very different uh, uh, like problems uh, in AI and physics. And um, yeah, so let's let's uh, start. So the things I would like to talk about today are uh, roughly summarized in this topic. So one topic that is very dear to me uh, is the idea of incorporating uh, some kind of structure domain knowledge uh, into machine learning models and generative models. And, uh, one point, one topic that's particularly important for applications in physics is the incorporation of symmetries. We expand a bit that. So I will uh, go through a bunch of tools that uh, uh, we and others de developed over the last few years to incorporate um, symmetries into machine learning and how we can then use these building blocks to build more and more uh, advanced uh, models. Then we'll talk about uh, some very some more uh, specific families of generative models uh, that incorporate these building blocks and, and meet a certain requirements that we need for uh, scientific applications. Then I'll go through two projects that, uh, that uh, uh, we have been working on. And one is uh, about uh, larger things like solids made out, out of microscopic molecules and try to uh, use machine learning to uh, accelerate a certain computations, uh, specifically uh, in this field of molecular dynamics or solids, a, a very important quantity is, is uh, called free energy. So we want to estimate differences uh, in the free energy between different molecular configurations or different physical states in the system. For example, the different free energy differences between being in the liquid and solid state or between mo two molecules being at, being uh, bound to each other or not, for example. And this has many applications in biology and industry, mm -hmm. potentially. Uh, and a more fundamental uh, uh, and a line of work that is uh, uh, applying all this machinery to uh, particle physics. So here we're simulating things that are much, much smaller. We're looking at uh, using uh, ML to accelerate the simulations of what's going on inside the proton, for example. And they're simulating the particles inside the proton, the gluons and the quarks, and interacting with each other using machine learning. 
and uh, there is a line of uh, papers there uh, over there and you can uh, go through them in different speeds based on interest and time so let's start so why do we care about symmetries in the first place? So the, uh, to me, the main reason we would uh, even care about uh, this in the first place is because we want to solve some uh, practical real world problem. Either some, uh, some uh, problem of industrial interest or scientific interest. And the symmetries, they appear everywhere, not just in particle physics, they appear in mechanical systems, uh, computer graphics, but uh, in physics, they appear in a very uh, strong way uh, in the sense that if you do not incorporate these symmetries in physical simulations, they simply will not meet the degree of accuracy that uh, would uh, make uh, machine learning useful in these fields. So uh, it is really important uh, if you uh, care about making accurate and very precise predictions. And uh, the outcome of trying to solve, to uh, help or solve these practical reward problems is that we develop as a community a wide range of tools that can be combined in many different ways uh, to uh, incorporate various types of symmetries and invariances uh, depending on what your requirements are. So the kind of problems that uh, uh, that we are interested in. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, first of all, just just set up some uh, basic language here. So uh, I mentioned invariance and equivariance, right? So just to set up a uh, basic notation and language, uh, what I mean by invariance is that there exists a set of transformations that leave my uh, output invariant, right? So for example, if I'm, I want to build uh, a animal classifier, right? So if there's a picture of a cat is slightly moved to the left or to the right, it is still a cat. So a classifier that outputs the label cat should be invariant to two-dimensional translations on, on the plane of the image, for example. This is the idea of invariance. The idea of equivariance is very similar, but is, a, is slightly more sophisticated, is the idea that uh, if I apply a transformation to the input of my function or my neural net, the output of this function or this neural net will behave in a similar way as the input. So this is what we call equivariance. One example of that uh, in the same context, again, is a convnet. So a convnet with just conv layers and elementwise nonlinearities is equivariant with respect to translations. So um, if you want to build an invariant output uh, from a covenant, you have to put some kind of pooling operator on the top. So that uh, uh, brings us to one mechanism to combine these things, for example. But the kind of problems that uh, I'm particularly interested, they look like this. So uh, we are trying to model uh, some physical problem. And uh, typically, there is already some uh, unnormalized density function that, uh, that has been given by physics. So the standard model of particle physics give us what the uh, unnormalized energy function of uh, different configurations of particle fields. Or physics gives us also what's the energy of a molecule. Now, what you want to do is, uh, in the end of the day, we want to compute uh, expectations of functions under samples from this target density. So this is a very classical problem in statistics and computer science in machine learning. You have some unnormalized target density and it's a sample from it, right? That's the most, probably the old, oldest problem in, one of the oldest problems in statistics. And as you can imagine, there are lots of methods uh, uh, for that. So why would expect uh, machine learning to help at all given the decades of uh, algorithms to do exactly this problem. And uh, this is what I'm trying, this will try, I try to, uh, this is the question that I, I try to address uh, in the rest of this talk. When you go down to fundamental physics or the applications that we have in mind for this, we know a lot about the data space. We know about these uh, target energies and where the data lives. So typically there is a prescribed manifold where the data lives. 
and we have a uh, deep knowledge about the structure of this energy function. Uh, and in this particular uh, slide, I'm illustrating the fact that there are transformations that leave it invariant, and uh, we know the exact set of transformations that leave it invariant. Uh, so what we want to do here is to build approximations. So we want to approximate these uh, energy, uh, energy uh, functions with uh, learned the proposal distributions that also incorporate the exact symmetries as opposed to approximate symmetries as uh, I will illustrate in this figure on the right here. Okay, so I think uh, hopefully that is enough motivation to why we would want to uh, incorporate symmetries into machine learning. Now I will go over a few tools that we de developed over the years to, to do exactly that. Uh, under various different symmetries, types of symmetry groups. So let's go. Let's let's go over this method. So, by far the most popular mechanism is what we call a group convolution. So this is exactly what a convnet is doing. A convnet is a particular case of a group convolution. In this case, the group uh, that you are convolving over uh, is the two-dimensional is the group of two-dimensional translations in the image plane. This formula looks a bit uh, 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 complicated or uh, for if you have not uh, uh, studied group theory before, but this is nothing but a convolution with some kernel. So you take some input and convolve it with a kernel. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, a convolution uh, a covenant is equivalent with respect to uh, two-dimensional translations, and you can be, uh, apply exactly the same principle to any group in theory, both to build equivariant maps and invariant maps. The problem with this approach is that it's completely not scalable. So now imagine that uh, you have now uh, rotations, right? So I want to build a covenant that's equivalent to 2D uh, translations and rotations. So if, you want to, if I want to use the group convolution approach, now I have to do a convolution over multiple axes on the input image. So the computational cost of this idea then will grow exponentially with the dimension of the symmetry group. So, okay, so this approach works for 2D images, but we cannot scale uh, this idea. So we have to do something else at large scale. I think the most promising way to try to attack this problem is by working directly with uh, known group invariants. So what I mean by that is, imagine that you want to build a function or a neural net that is invariant with respect to rigid uh, translations. Right, so this appears all the time if I model, if I have some point cloud data and I want to classify it or do some uh, translation invariant uh, prediction uh, from a point cloud data. One obvious way of doing that, for example, to be to build a neural net who, uh, whose input features are just pairwise distances or three-way angles between the points in this point cloud. So this would obviously be an invariant function on the uh, rigid translation. So, and this is uh, indeed uh, uh, what is behind the main applications of graph nets and transformers to various uh, types of scientific data. Not just with respect to uh, translations in this simple example, but rotations and various other potentially relevant uh, transformations. Uh, one uh, symmetry, one type of invariance that's particularly important in quantum mechanics, in pretty much any kind of quantum mechanical modeling, is invariance with respect to matrix conjugation. So imagine that uh, my input to my neural net is some matrix X, so some complex matrix, and I want the outputs of this neural net to be invariant with respect to this transformation uh, uh, at the top here, which is a matrix conjugation transformation for some unitary matrix U. So we know that all such invariants are traces of powers of the matrix X. So an obvious way to build a neural net uh, that's invariant is to build a neural net whose input features are exactly that, traces of powers of X. So that's another a pretty uh, obvious example of how to do that. 
So, uh, uh, for example, the, this uh, uh, symmetry, which is uh, relatively simple, would be really complex to implement with group convolution, as I mentioned earlier. It would be a very complicated uh, and expensive uh, uh, operation to try to build this invariant uh, using group convolutions method. So directly working with group invariants and group equivariants, I think, is the only uh, scalable way to uh, do that. So these are some simple building, building blocks. Uh, another type of symmetry that appears all the time everywhere in computer science are, is uh, permutation invariants. So, uh, well, let's say I want to build the distribution over sets, right? A set, a uh, collection of elements uh, up to a permutation. So if I want to build a density over a collection of over a set, my density has to be invariant with respect to permutation. So this is a particular example that appears uh, in physics. I want to model a density that has this six-fold symmetry that you can see on the left. So. One quite uh, straightforward mechanism to build such a density is to uh, use what we call a canonicalization map. So a canonicalization map, it takes, uh, uh, it, it, it uh, basically takes uh, any one of the six instances uh, of this uh, symmetry group and maps that to a canonical cell, like you can see on the right here. On the right, we have a canonicalization map that maps uh, all this, uh, uh, any of the six cells to a canonical cell. And now the problem now of building a density in this space is reduced to the problem of modeling a density on the full space to put a density on a single cell. And then we can reverse this map. We can do the uh, uh, inverse of this operation so you can have the full uh, six-fold symmetry uh, Again, so this is a, a uh, one uh, straightforward mechanism uh, to create permutation invariance uh, in density estimation. Although it's not uh, in, uh, straightforward to implement uh, in some cases. Uh, now I think uh, the thing I think uh, we can build something more interesting by combining invariant functions. To build equivariant functions because uh, these allow this give us a lot of freedom now to build such maps. So there's a little lemma that uh, is uh, uh, that is uh, uh, very important uh, uh, in physics to, uh, when, uh, when you build models, uh, which uh, is the following. So if you have an invariant function with respect to some uh, orthogonal group, uh, uh, and if you take its gradients. So the gradients will be equivalent with respect to the same group. That is, one mechanism to build equivalent functions is to build invariant functions and then take their gradients. So in some cases, this simplifies massively the problem. So the example I have here is that uh, how is an example of building a permutation uh, equivalent map. And so I start. We start from a permutation invariant map and apply a transformation to that. Of course, permutation equivariance uh, we can also achieve in many other ways. Uh, again, uh, with transformers is a one very popular example of achieving such, uh, such equivariance. Uh, this is a bit more uh, uh, advanced, uh, advanced uh, but it will be very important later on on some of our applications. So recall that I mentioned that uh, matrix conjugation equivariance or invariance appears in all the time in quantum mechanics. So that's not different in particle physics. Uh, but there uh, we are interested in more than just being invariant or equivariant. So we want to build a map on the space of matrices that is invertible and the matrix conjugation equivariant. So these two requirements together actually are quite restrictive. And uh, we managed to, you can prove mathematically that any such a map is what we call uh, a spectral map. That is any transformation acting on unitary groups that is both a diffeomorphism that is differentiable and invertible, roughly speaking, and equivalent with respect to matrix conjugation. It has to be a map that acts on the eigenvalues in a permutation equivalent way. 
so that's just a uh, distillation of uh, the, the result we have here. And so uh, this is also, uh, I think it's a very interesting uh, mathematical fact that uh, if you want to build a matrix conjugation equivariance into machine learning or in any function space, uh, the problem actually gets reduced to a permutation equivariance uh, requirement, which is very interesting if you think that uh, matrix conjugation equivariance is a continuous symmetry, is a continuous symmetry group, and uh, permutation equivariance is a discrete thing. So in the end of the day, at the heart of many of the symmetries, permutation equivariance uh, always, is always lurking uh, in, the, in the back. So it's very important to develop tools, efficient and expressive mechanisms to build permutation equivariance in general. Uh, now, uh, so I've been giving very specific examples of how we can incorporate uh, equivariance into machine learning. Uh, but I think there is a uh, kind of overarching like theme and uh, mm -hmm. we can try to unify all of these tools into a single uh, way of thinking about the problem, which is uh, basically uh, trying to ask the question of how can we generalize a covenant to uh, an arbitrary manifold uh, and to what uh, it's called in mathematics, fiber bundles. Um, okay, so let's try to expand a bit uh, our understanding of a conv convolution operator. So as you're very familiar, if you have a two-dimensional or n-dimensional image uh, in 2D, uh, we can see the features uh, of this image of, or of this data structure as a vector field in the Euclidean space. And the ConvNet, what it does is at every point, it builds linear combinations of these uh, vectors at neighboring locations, right? So that's what the ConvNet does. Okay, so let's try to see what happens now if we are in a manifold. What's, uh, why, this is pro why this is a problem and you cannot just take linear combinations of neighbors. Um, uh, the problem is illustrated in, uh, in this figure. Uh, imagine that uh, we are talking about this, our manifold is a sphere, right? Some simple things so you can visualize what's going on. Uh, let's say we have vectors that live in the tangent space of this sphere at different points. Now imagine that I move along the sphere. I, that is, I do translation operator. I apply a translation operator to these points. What you observe is that uh, uh, vectors, so these feature vectors that are in the tangent space of the sphere at the different points, they will not transform in the same way under a translation or a rotation operation. That means that uh, if I take linear combinations of vectors that are at a different points that are in the tangent space of different points, you know, uh, uh, these linear combinations will be neither invariant nor equivariant with respect to translations or rotations. So we need to do something else. So a convolution cannot be straightforwardly just applied to a mesh on a sphere if you want to preserve invariance or equivariance under translations and rotations. Uh, in a slightly more advanced uh, language, uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can say that uh, linear combinations of elements belong to different fibers. Uh, uh, do not belong to any fiber. Uh, but that's the problem. That's the main problem. Uh, but thankfully, there is a quite there is a solution to this problem, and the solution is called a parallel transport. So, roughly speaking, parallel transport is uh, is uh, propagating a vector on the uh, a vector from one point to another point in a way that is compatible with the, the transformations at the new point. So very, very, without going into the math of how to build the parallel transport, that's what it does. So it takes a, uh, an object or a vector at the point Y and uh, it uh, transports it or propagates it to another point X. 
And this now, this transported uh, vector at the point X, it uh, will transform uh, in exactly the same way as any other vector at point X. So now uh, with this, uh, if, you, uh, if you have this parallel transport operator now, we can now uh, work out our general, generalization of a convnet, of a convolution operator, which is first, we uh, look at uh, a neighbor, neighborhood region on our manifold. And then at every point that we want to consider in this neighborhood, we have to parallel transport them to our current point. And only then I can take linear combinations of those points. So this is uh, a par this is what we uh, call a parallel transport uh, con parallel transport the convnet. It's a convnet built out of these generalized convolutions uh, instead of the naive convolutions uh, that work on a flat space, for example. So this uh, is. The, this uh, this allow us to uh, once we uh, generalize the convolutions uh, this way, then the rest of the machinery can be almost the same as normal uh, building normal covenants or machine learning. Uh, but there is still a few things we have to sort out. Uh, so I will not go into the details of this slide, uh, but. Uh, uh, going again back to matrix conjugation equivariance, and uh, 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 I want to show you a very concrete example of this built in practice. So, the problem, this problem is already a problem of interest to particle physics, uh, but we don't have to think about particle physics to understand what uh, that means. Is that imagine that you have a space at, where at each point there is a matrix W, and this matrix W. Uh, is equivalent with respect to a set of transformations uh, in, by matrix conjugation equivalence uh, as uh, shown in the top. I want to build a covenant on this object that's equivalent to matrix conjugation equivalence. So as I said, the first thing to do is to, def to build the parallel transport of a matrix W. And uh, this is exactly what this uh, box in red here does. So I want to build the convolution layer. So first I have to uh, build this parallel, transport, parallel transported version of this object W. And only then I can take uh, linear combinations of these objects as usual in a convnet. Now the question is what kind of nonlinearities I can use? So obviously not Every linear, the, not any linear, I cannot use any linearity I want because this will also break permutation, this will also break conjugation equivalence. And here below, I show you two examples of nonlinear layers that we could apply to such data. And so one is building products of these matrices, obviously, products of uh, matrices W uh, at the same location in space will transform uh, in the same way, so it's equivariant. And if I multiply a matrix W by a sc invariant scalar function, this will also uh, transform in the same way under matrix conjugation. So these are two examples of nonlinearities that we can use to build our convnet that will be a matrix conjugation equivariant. So, and I think this is probably the most general uh, way to construct such functions. Uh, so it's very powerful to assimilate that uh, if your goal is to uh, really have the most general and expressive machine learning tools for the job. Now I've been talking about these building blocks, right? That we can use to build like in, Invariant functions and equivariant functions, or invariant covenants or equivariant covenants. I have not talked about generative models. So generative models are not just covenants. They are, they are, they use machine learning. They use neural nets inside to build densities. So they define some density. And so, how do you build densities uh, with these tools now? First, uh, uh, you, uh, one question that you might have from what I mentioned so far is that at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned what we really want in the end of the day is, some, is to approximate a density that is invariant. So 
why talk about equivariance in the first place? So in the end of the day, we want to build some invariant density. So why think about equivariance? And the reason is this little lemma, which is the following. So if you, uh, if you, uh, one mechanism to build an invariant density is to start from a very simple invariant density. Let's say a, a spherical Gaussian is invariant uh, under uh, rotations, for example. So I can, let's say I want to build a complicated density that's invariant under rotations. So I can start from a Gauss, a spherical Gaussian, and uh, I apply a transformation to that via a neural net or some other mechanism. And as long as this transformation is equivalent with respect to rotations, then the density after the transformation will still be invariant. So this is a quite simple result actually, but it's uh, very powerful because it uh, uh, basically allows us to divide and conquer the problem. So typically it's very easy to come up with a simple invariant density, in this case, the spherical Gaussian, uh, or in the case of quantum mechanics and gauge symmetry uh, that you see later on, the higher measure. And it's very easy to sample from and evaluate it. And uh, it's typically, uh, it can be easier to then, uh, once you have that, we can then focus on building this equivariant transformation. And um, now you can shift the focus from the invariant to the equivariance in this way. Uh, as a way of reducing the complexity of the problem. Uh, uh, and a family of models that, uh, that uh, we uh, have been focusing on, uh, on our groups uh, is called the normalizing flows. And uh, normalizing flows are not uh, required for this task. Uh, uh, you could perfectly imagine uh, many other families of generative models, GANs, VAEs, diffusion, etc., could incorporate this kind of symmetry as well. Uh, but flows, they are particularly attractive uh, for reasons that I expand a little bit uh, later on. And uh, they work like this. Uh, the idea is to start again, start with some simple density and apply a sequence, a sequence of uh, invertible diff uh, transformations or diffeomorphisms uh, to that uh, starting initial density. And then uh, the, the whole point of this is that uh, that every one of these maps makes the target slightly more expressive, slightly more complex density. And then hopefully, uh, if you have enough of such compositions, uh, by the end of it, uh, you'll be able to approximate your desired target. Uh, of course, this is a very simple idea. So all the where is the research here? So the research is in coming up with these maps, so these transformations. That's where all the... Uh, all the research, uh, uh, like normalizing flows research, uh, happens because we want these maps to uh, have uh, several properties. First, as I mentioned, we want them to be equivariant with respect to some group. And second, uh, uh, as you can see here in the formula, to calculate the density after transformation, I need to know the determinant of their Jacobian. And uh, so a requirement is that uh, uh, whatever this F is, this transformation is, I must be able to compute this determinant in a reasonable amount of compute and memory. So this is, these are the three main constraints we have to think about uh, when you're thinking, when you are working with this model family. So I'll just go over now uh, some popular architecture, some uh, and some of the developments uh, in the last couple of years on normalizing flow models uh, 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 to give a broader context of how these models are built. So a very popular mechanism uh, is called a masked autoregressive flow. So the idea is to you is to split the data, your data vectors into subgroups. And uh, this allow us to uh, very easily build a uh, transformations that have triangular Jacobians. And as you can, as you know, the determinant of triangular matrix is just the product of the diagonal elements. So this allow us, us to have some very scalable uh, determinant computation. So that's the 
primary reason why this is so popular, uh, this architecture. It of, of course has drawbacks uh, and uh, in many cases, it actually does not make sense to split, to partition the data. And this is one of the major uh, issues with this way of building these models. So a very interesting family of uh, normalizing flows are continuous time uh, flows, which you build from all these. The principle is exactly the same. Now, instead of having a finite number of transformations, you have an infinite number of transformations that are integrated with some uh, a numerical integrator or the integrator. And uh, this construction has many advantages over masked flows, but it has also disadvantages. One is that the log likelihood of this is very expensive to compute. So I cannot simply evaluate a function and get the likelihood uh, of this model. I have to integrate uh, uh, the divergence of its Jacobian uh, over a path to get the likelihood. And uh, this, this makes it very uh, expensive, computationally expensive to approximate the likelihood function. And it's a really a pity because this is really a nice family of models. So obviously you can extend this ODE flows to many folds, and this has been done in a couple of papers. Uh, you just have now to account uh, for the geometry of the manifold uh, with it by incorporating the determinant of the metric there. Uh, a particular case of this uh, family, which is very close to many physical problems, problems that appear in physics, is what's called motion pair flows. So these are all the flows where the, the lost vector uh, is the gradient of a potential function. So, so it's, a, it's just a particular case of OD flows. But this is the kind of flows that appears in physics. So in physics, uh, dynamics, if you think about where dynamic equations come from, they come from uh, the order Lagrange equations of motion that take a scalar quantity called the action and then uh, up, and they derive equations of motion from that. So this is how, uh, this is why uh, typical physical equations of motions, they, they are ODs of this type where the forces are gradients of some potential. Okay, there, uh, from the physics literature, there is a class of models called the trivializing maps which uh, is a different type of uh, OD flow where, uh, where you have a precise target at each time step for that flow. Uh, uh, so may, perhaps the closest thing you can imagine in uh, machine learning and statistics uh, to this idea is the idea of annealing important sampling. So the idea is that you start from some simple density and you gradually interpolate between that and your target. Now at each point in this fictitious time, you have a target. So the idea of the trivializing maps as presented uh, in the work mentioned below is that uh, now we can build a continuous time flow that has a precise target at every time step, which is to match this annealing, uh, this annealing path. So this is what was called trivializing map. A, another family of uh, uh, models that uh, nicely uh, fits up with various things I said about uh, uh, symmetries is what's called the convex potential flows. The idea is that uh, uh, if you have a strongly convex function, so it's gradient and you take its gradient. So this gradient will be a diffeomorphism, roughly speaking. So you can use that to build uh, models. And uh, you, you can show that these are universal density approximators. Uh, of course, uh, again, unfortunately, uh, there are uh, a very strong trade-off here because uh, usually computing the determinant of the Jacobian of this flow, which translates into computing the determinant of the Hessian of this uh, scalar uh, function is very expensive in general. So it's not very scalable. This idea, uh, there is a beautiful uh, theory behind this kind of flows or manifolds called uh, optimal transports in in, in, uh, in, in Romanian manifolds. And uh, you can build uh, equivariant versions of these models and, uh, and generalize it to various different groups. I will not expand the details of these constructions, but uh, 
uh, you can extend convex potential flows to arbitrary manifolds. Again, uh, scalability is a major constraint. Uh, it is very hard to uh, actually work with these generalized models in many or manifolds. So as I mentioned, uh, I would exp I want to, uh, uh, I was going to expand why this family of models normalizing flows. Why do I focus so much on this family of models? And the main the main reason is the, are these three points that I have in this slide. Is that uh, is that uh, uh, first and foremost, I want to be able to sample very fast. I want to be able to produce very quickly and uh, and by quickly mean in uh, in terms of uh, memory and computer demands a sample from my model uh, but that's not sufficient requirement for a scientific application so these physical problems uh, uh, requires that that uh, I must be able to to train via a, a an existing algorithm of these models to match a given unnormalized energy and secondly, uh, and thirdly, uh, I need a, uh, to be able to compute the gradient of uh, whatever my loss function is uh, cheaply. That is, by that typically I mean linear in the amount of samples and uh, hopefully linearly in the dimension of the data, although uh, linear in the data is uh, often very hard to achieve, in, linear in the dimension of the data. Uh, I would say there's actually a fourth requirement, uh, which is very strong, which is I want to make very accurate predictions, because if I just want to make some loose predictions, I will go to the business of generating uh, nice images and pictures of cats, not the picture of predicting free energy and molecules. So I need to, pre to make very accurate predictions, and in practice, Making accurate predictions mean that you should never trust your models. Uh, and uh, you must have some uh, mechanism with a kind of guarantee that uh, you can uh, remove bias from the model. So I want to compute expectations from it. So how can I correct the samples of a model or its likelihood such that mm -hmm. I can accurately compute expectations, for example, or I can accurately make predictions that are calibrated. Uh, so this fourth requirement is why uh, we focus on models that have uh, exact likelihood. Because uh, at the very least, so models with likelihoods, there are a couple of algorithms that we can then apply to calibrate them, to correct them, that are at least uh, in the uh, asymptotical regime of the correction produce and bias the results. So this, this, these are strong requirements to, uh, uh, I think they are really crucial to, uh, so that these models are actually useful in science applications because there you have very restrict precision uh, uh, requirements. And uh, if you uh, cannot meet a certain precision or accuracy in the prediction, the method is not gonna be useful, doesn't matter how fast it is. Uh, so this is just a detail that uh, as one, to a, one example of a loss that has approximately the desired data of the things I mentioned before in combination with uh, flows that have exact uh, likelihood. But that's just a usual uh, a gradient computation uh, that you usually do in an automated way. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, we cannot trust uh, the models. We cannot take their samples and their numerical likelihood values at face value. So we have to fix them in order to make accurate predictions. And uh, this is where uh, uh, the overall theme of these corrections is what uh, some people uh, uh, call a tractable model in a intractable pipeline. Uh, so let's say you have a fitter model to target density. So one of the most obvious things you could do to fix it is a simple accept reject uh, mechanism. Uh, so that is you, you create a Markov chain with your model inside, producing ID samples and you accept reject them according to a probability, uh, according to Metropolis Hastings algorithm. 
So that would be the most obvious mechanism. But uh, obviously, uh, I can imagine this will have very, uh, very can have very strong shortcomings if uh, the the model is not very accurate, or especially if the tail behavior of the model is not uh, 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 very well behaved or under control. This algorithm may result into very very long chains of rejection. So you can have like millions of samples that are rejected. And uh, it may not be uh, worth uh, having the training model in the first place. Uh, but there's something better we can do. So uh, we call this uh, Anilia de Flow Transport Monte Carlo. And there are a couple of papers uh, on, on this topic already, which is the idea is to marry a very old idea, very old algorithm, which is Anilia de Importance Sampling and uh, combining it with the state-of-the-art uh, generative models that have exact likelihood. Mm -hmm. So as uh, if you're familiar with any of the important sampling, the idea is that uh, you create a chain of targets that start from some uh, uh, very simple density, let's say a Gaussian, and uh, gradually anneal it to a, a, your desired target density that you want to sample from. And uh, at each temperature, you can have some uh, uh, MCMC algorithm to, to produce samples at a, that fixed temperature. And then you need some kind of mechanism to do the transport from one temperature to the next temperature in the chain. And uh, usually this transport map is taken to be the identity map. Uh, that is, you just carry over the samples from the previous temperature to the next temperature, and then you readjust that with uh, important sampling and the resampling plus a little bit of MCMC. So that's the usual importance, uh, uh, annealed important sampling uh, me method. Uh, the idea here is that now, instead of having just a, this naive identity map, that's where we put our model. So now the, the purpose of this model is to learn to take a sample at temperature one and map it to temperature two. And uh, this is uh, arguably a lot easier task than try to directly learn to sample from the target density, especially if the target density is some very hard, very contrived density to sample from, like some density that is super concentrated on a sub, sub, uh, sub manifold uh, uh, or that has many modes. Uh, uh, so this problem can become a lot easier than learning the target directly. And, and uh, I think this is currently the most promising uh, ways, uh, uh, this is most promising um, uh, mechanism to combine learn the models with uh, a something that has some guarantees of convergence. Okay, so now let's talk about some applications of this. Uh, of these uh, uh, building blocks and methods. So the first project I want to mention uh, is uh, this project on uh, free energy estimation uh, on solids. So this problem, as I mentioned, appears uh, in many problems in physics, uh, chemistry, and biology, uh, and relates to phase transitions uh, and uh, uh, whether uh, some drug will bind to a protein or not. This is all based on free energy calculation. So if you can do this very, very efficiently, uh, we'll, uh, we could, in principle, uh, accelerate or help this, these fields. And so one problem that uh, we attacked at this paper was uh, 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 the uh, what's called the targeted approach uh, for free energy estimation, which is uh, I have a physical system in two different uh, configurations. Uh, these are uh, described in terms of two different uh, Boltzmann distributions, so two unnormalized density, uh, density functions. And the method for estimating the free energy, which is uh, the uh, uh, essentially the uh, expectation of the difference in the energies of the two, of, of the exponential of the difference in the energy of the two, is to come up with a map that transforms one density into another. And this map, this idea is very old in physics, in, this, in the chemical physics literature. And, but uh, these maps were originally constructed by hand. 
use the, the physical intuition of the uh, uh, using using some physical intuition uh, uh, we have about the problem. Uh, but here the idea is very simple. Let's replace these maps with learned maps. So that's what we did. And uh, uh, and this problem, uh, I should have, um, I should, uh, there's a missing slide, there's sort of apologies for that. So the, there, uh, this problem, it has a few symmetries. So one symmetry is that uh, all the particles live in a, in a lattice, in a solid lattice. So of course, then we have uh, some boundary conditions. So in this case, the boundary conditions are periodic boundary conditions, and you have a permutation symmetry of the particles. So there's translation symmetry in the lattice and the permutation uh, symmetry of the particles. So uh, all the tools I have presented allow us to build maps with the symmetries and that's what we build for this problem. Uh, this problem, these mappings uh, are quite hard to do, but we, we uh, can considerably improve over handcrafted maps in this problem. So there, I would say there's still a long way to go uh, to make a really substantial difference, but in terms of like pure statistical uh, metrics, uh, we can do a lot better than handcrafted maps uh, uh, in this problem already. And uh, incorporating all this domain knowledge about the target, the symmetries, permutation, equivalence of particles, translation symmetry, and the boundary conditions into the flows uh, is crucial uh, to achieve that. So what the figure here shows is, um, uh, is, uh, uh, it shows that the uh, uh, it shows the two densities that we are trying to map into another. As you can see, they are very far apart in the distribution space, and uh, the model brings them brings them closer together, but they're still quite very far, as you can see this in in, in uh, inset plot uh, there. So there's some uh, substantial gain there, but the, 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 they're still quite far apart from each other in this problem. So this problem is particularly hard uh, yet, but, uh, but uh, there's some nice progress. So the direction where we have been making most of our progress are in what's called the lattice uh, 3CD, which is the problem uh, of simulating a very, uh, very fundamental uh, uh, objects in physics called uh, particle fields. So this is a, a, a collaboration with lots of uh, amazing people. I'm very grateful for this collaboration. And let's start with a simple problem in two dimensions to see how uh, what we do. So as I mentioned, physics give us the target energy. So in this case, uh, it's come. It, this problem is a particular is a, a subset. Uh, of the standard model of particle physics, where we have a, what's called a scalar particle and a fermion field. And uh, the purpose of our model is to produce joint samples of this scalar field and this fermion field uh, according to this uh, energy function. Yeah. So of course, this is very uh, abstract. Uh, we can translate that into a machine and uh, formulation that a computer can understand by discretizing everybody and writing into terms and writing rewriting in terms of uh, standard uh, vector objects vector like objects and uh, we can build the flows that uh, uh, assimilate all this machinery about translation variance uh, and the symmetries there and uh, this particular model doesn't have a very large symmetry group. So the focus on symmetry here is not so strong. But the point is that you can build uh, models for this problem. And, uh, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, there are many uh, different algorithms to correct uh, biases uh, for the model that translates into different um, MCMC schemes for bias correction that we have investigated. And here is just to uh, show you the kind of accuracies that we get with this method. So this quantity C here is, is an observable, which is the expectation of some, uh, of a, of some very specifically uh, physically meaningful function of these scalar field configurations in a two-dimensional lattice. 
And this is a function of time. So uh, these simulations happen in a two-dimensional lattice where one of the axes is time and the other dimension is a space. So this is a function that's a function that has been marginalized uh, over space and now it becomes just a function of time. And if here we are comparing uh, what kind of biases or errors we get uh, using various different of different types of models and MCMC schemes. And uh, uh, they uh, we can get them to agree with each other with uh, uh, very nice accuracy of the of the order of on the order of uh, uh, one percent or lower for this problem target. So that's quite encouraging. But this is by far not the most interesting problem that we that we can try to solve. I'm not I'll not go over. Uh, some specific details there. Uh, the, the problem that took us uh, most of our energy and effort is when we have what's called a gauge symmetry, which is now we are not uh, simulating these scalar fields anymore. So scalar fields are what the name suggests, are just the scalar functions in Rn. So there's no uh, internal structure to them. But if you want to simulate uh, 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 now the uh, Interesting part. To uh, uh, work with them, and these particles are mathematically are represented uh, mathematically by uh, unitary matrices that live in a, in a lattice, in a four-dimensional lattice, and uh, uh, so these are just to uh, to show the. The papers that we have. So this is like illustrate how that works in 2D. So uh, we work with it again, of course, to put the things on a computer, we have to discretize this, uh, these actions, action objects. And uh, when you talk about these gloom fields, let's focus only, only on the gloom particles. So uh, after we do the discretization in, the, uh, in a meaningful way and the work out uh, how the, the target energy will look like uh, on a 2D lattice, it, it looks like this. It is a, uh, actually, it's a deceivingly simple object. So the idea is that if we build in a two-dimensional lattice, at each uh, link or edge in this lattice, there, are, there is a, uh, a matrix that is, that is in the um, special unitary group. And the target is built out of little loops. So you take these matrices and take their product along all, all one by one loops in the lattice. And then you take the traces of these loops and you sum uh, the real part of these traces over every location, all the locations and directions, and that's the target energy. So as a mathematical object, it's quite simple. Now, the only thing that's left to do is to sample from this target energy. So the state of the art uh, in this field is to use uh, HMC. And uh, we're trying to uh, uh, we're trying to find a model that is sufficiently good to justify uh, it is it is compute relative to HMC in terms of sample efficiency. And as I mentioned, this is where all this equivalence machinery kicks in because there is a set of transformations that leave the target uh, uh, energy invariant. So this, this is the set of transformations. This uh, slide uh, shows what this transformation look like. So if I transform every link in the lattice according to this rule where omega is a unitary matrix, these little loops that are called plaquettes, they transform like this. So if you remember my slide about matrix conjugation transformation equivalence, so that's exactly what I'm talking about. So in this problem, these little loops in the lattice, they, they are matrix conjugation equivalent quantities. So they this matrix conjugation equivalence plays a crucial role in building a model for this problem. And this bottom part of the slides, just to show that the trace of these uh, loops, uh, trace of these plaquettes, they are invariant objects. So that's why the energy function is invariant because it's built out of these traces. Again, as I said, we have this uh, divide and conquer mechanism 
mm-hmm. to build uh, invariant densities there. So I'm not uh, going to too many details uh, to save time here, but the point is we can use all that machinery to build uh, normalizing flows here, represented by this letter F here with parameter theta, that are also equivariant. So the, the construction uses pretty much everything I presented before. All the, all the blocks that I mentioned are inside this F here. So it's quite complicated, but the idea is pretty simple. Uh, again, I'll not explain this uh, too many de- technical details. As I, as I mentioned uh, at some point, uh, we have shown that uh, to build matrix conjugation equivalent uh, diffeomorphisms in unitar groups, we have to work on the eigenspace of these matrices. So this is just to illustrate how that works. Uh, uh, this is just to illustrate uh, the, again, how the permutation equivariance appears uh, as a consequence of gauge equivariance. And uh, we've had to develop various types of normalizing flows to uh, work with this. And this is how it looks in the end of the day. So it looks like this onion uh, uh, object that we have many uh, different types of flows inside, but in the end of the day, it uh, satisfies exactly the symmetry of the problem. So that's the important thing. Uh, we can very compactly express uh, this model by a very simple diagram uh, where we build the flows like this. Uh, I'm not, again, I'm not ex- uh, expand the, phys- the details of the physics of this. Uh, I'll go straight to the one of the main results, which is this. So the important thing to look at this plot is that this Q object is a very hard, uh, observable to compute. And the reason it is hard is that the, the target density has modes that are uh, very well separated. And each mode corresponds to a different value of this variable Q called the topological charge. So imagine a target density that has many modes. And it, to each mode, there is an integer associated to them. And now we want to calculate what's the distribution of these integer numbers. So, and here we compare uh, the uh, uh, Markov chain built out of state-of-the-art uh, uh, Gibbs sampler for this problem and out of state-of-the-art HMC for this problem. And what we get when you build the Markov chain with the learned modern side. So the orange here is the model and the blue and the gray are the uh, traditional samplers used for this problem. As we can see for this particular problem, we have a, a much greater mixing rate uh, in, as measured by Markov uh, chain steps than uh, the traditional method. So this, this is very encouraging. It is still a two-dimensional problem, so it's not physically realistic, but that's uh, still encouraging. And I will not expand this latest paper. This paper now does uh, joint simulations of gluons and quarks. And you have uh, now the set of symmetries is much bigger, is a bit more complicated, but you can still apply the same machinery. You can see this parallel transport operators there. So it's uh, uh, things get involved, more involved, but uh, we can use the same techniques to, uh, to build the variance there. And this is the same kind of result. We can um, uh, substantially accelerate the mixing rate of some uh, strategic observables that are hard to mix with HMC. So I think that that's the main, that's really what we want to achieve uh, for this problem. And uh, to conclude, uh, uh, to mention uh, what we have learned with this, uh, we can use all this machinery to incorporate gauge symmetries. And most of the works have been done in two dimensions, uh, but they are quite promising. So now we are working on a four dimensional version of these models. there's lots of challenges associated coming from the physics side, uh, but to not, I will not expand this on. And uh, that's it. So this is a very active area of research. And uh, there's uh, there are many other groups also that started working on this right now. So it's a very exciting field to be on. So thank you very much for your time. And uh, hopefully you have some time to uh, chat a bit. Thank you very much, uh, Danilo. So uh, essentially the problem is very interesting and the idea is uh, inspiring. Uh, for now, let's see whether there are questions from the audience.
Is there any question? Okay, so here I have a question from, uh, hi. Uh, Chirong, could you, uh, how can you ask a question? Okay, Chirong, please go ahead. Chirong, I think now you can speak. Okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, thanks, Kun. I was figuring out how to do that. So, uh, so uh, Danielo, you, you mentioned uh, quite a, in quite a few places that uh, MCMC algorithms uh, are being used in your work. And I was kind of curious if there was a, a, a connection between, um, uh, say, the, the different parts of, of what you shared today, right? So, so it wasn't clear to me if the MCMC was being used in some of the uh, other work about, uh, let's say, um, you know, the symmetries work or the work on energy functions. Um, could, could you at least uh, explain a little bit whether these these pieces of work are intersecting or or like or like separate research thrusts? Right, I'm just interested in that. Yeah, so uh, we have parallel streams of work. So the one parallel stream is to develop the MCMC. Uh, again, as I mentioned, this idea of combining the um, annealed important transport flows. So flows plus annealed important sampling. And uh, all the like the machinery to build the uh, covariances and symmetries uh, go into the flow part. So when mm -hmm. you build a uh, um, HMC, for example, for these problems, the HMC will naturally uh, have all the symmetries already because it inherits from the target. Uh, by this, the, the same mechanisms that I mentioned, right? The HMC has the, you calculate these gradients and the gradients come from uh, the gradients of this Hamiltonian. And because the Hamiltonian is invariant, the gradients are automatically equivariant. So the HMC is, uh, 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 are automatically equivalent. Uh, but uh, when you now combine HMC and um, models like done in the transport and the, in the Zanil transport uh, papers, then the model part has to still be equivalent in order for the whole chain to preserve the symmetry. So that's where all this machinery goes there. But these things can be seen as independent problems in some sense. So. Uh, you can try to train a model without any MCMC. And then once it's trained, then you can put that inside of an MCMC chain to correct for it, correct mm, the I biases see. of the model. So, so uh, you're... Oh, and, and um, if, if you don't mind, uh, a, a bit of another question I wanted, because I'm not a from a physics background, so I'm trying to understand the significance of the different pieces of work you presented. Yes. Uh, um, so uh, I, the, the impression I get from, from uh, how you talked about Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo and its application to flow problems is that it seems that the characteristic that makes uh, especially these physics applications uh, different from the uh, more uh, I, I, I won't use the word mainstream, but say more the more typically familiar uh, ML applications in computer vision or natural language processing or time series data. It seems to be that there's all of these, um, uh, you know, uh, is, it, is it the case that there are higher order differentials involved in, in this, uh, in these kinds of equations that result in the need for uh, the types of techniques you proposed. Like, I wanted to understand what is the mathematical uh, uniqueness of the problems that you're trying to solve and how it necessitates different, uh, say, application of mod, you know, MCMC techniques. Uh, and I'm asking this, I think, with a view of uh, me not being a physicist. It's, I'm asking this right. with a view of trying to understand what other application areas uh, could this translate to, right? Where, where there's similar, there's some of these similar um, mathematical structures, higher order structures, uh, if, if that's the case, right? I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to understand what I've seen so far. Yes. Yeah, so thank you very much for this question. And uh, so there, there are many points to, uh, so let's start to unfold a bit the things that I mentioned. So this idea of higher order differentials, that's one aspect. So the continuous formulation of these energy functions, they are like integrals over some manifold with differential operators inside. 
Mm. Uh, but of course, in the, uh, when you try to model to sample from this thing, we are not uh, trying to attack the continuous version. Uh, this will be this is an extremely hard problem to work on the continuous formulation. So we discretize this thing. So the differential operators now become local finite differences in the manifold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the target. So that's why all these target energies for coming from physics, uh, in, at least in this particular problem of light scarcity, they are like they look like these finite differences going inside. Uh, there's a bit more to the story with this parallel transport uh, problem, as I mentioned, right? Uh, we cannot take objects that are in the tangent space of the manifold at different points of the tangent space and put them together. You have to do the parallel transport. And then, so, so when you do the discretization, you have to account for this. So this complicates a bit more, but it's still, it, it's still just a discretization of the differential operator. That's one side of it. The reason why they are very hard to sample from is because these densities are uh, have very peculiar things that uh, I'm not sure I have encountered these properties uh, as strongly in machine learning problems, which is one, they are extremely concentrated on a submanifold or on some region in the, in the space of possible samples. So they have very, very uh, small support in some area region. The second problem, and uh, that this appears, for example, uh, that that in, that that uh, appear in many physical problems, is that uh, if you're near a phase transition, imagine like when you go from a liquid state to a solid state. So what happens there? It means that the correlation between the molecules diverges, right? At phase transition, you have a so if you're in a liquid state, you have just a bunch of uh, independent molecules that are eventually bouncing on each other. But when you go to a solid state, now they form a grid. They form kind of 3D lattice. And that is the correlation between the fluctuations of their position diverges in the correlation length of this correlation diverges. So this makes traditional, uh, this makes method sampling with uh, Gibbs sampling, where you perturb one dimension at a time, or HMC, really hard because uh, these methods, they, uh, they do not make global proposals to be accepted. Right? They make these local things, and uh, and uh, this makes it really hard uh, to uh, have a proposal that get, ever gets accepted by the metropolis hasting steps. Uh, so this problem is uh, also appears in machine learning. So if you try to uh, work with Boltzmann machines, for example, and you try to build a MCMC chain uh, that samples from the Boltzmann machine, with Gibbs sampling, you encounter a very similar problem that uh, if you build a Gibbs sampler that proposes one uh, bit at a time, the likelihood of acceptance is very, very, very low. So, so the algorithms that are efficient are algorithms that, uh, try, ten, that try to do some global pro proposal that affects all the bits simultaneously. And you do that with a needed important sampling by building this chain and our temporary sampling. Um, so it's, these problems are not unsolvable with HMC in physics. That's what they've been used, uh, using. Uh, actually, HMC was invented for lattice QCD. That's how it was created, is to solve exactly this problem. And uh, what we're trying to do is not to replace HMC. We're just trying to uh, find the sweet spot where machine learning can accelerate the computation. Where if you have this very long uh, correlation length, uh, this assumes like a strategic spot to put a model that makes global proposals and reduce the the uh, rejection strikes in the MCMC chain. So uh, I wouldn't be able to tell you an exact parallel problem like this that I have encountered before in machine learning, but there are very hard to sample problems in machine learning. Like uh, if you ever try to fit a Gaussian process with MCMC on the meta parameters, on the hyperparameters, you see that the likelihood has a really nice shape on the hyperparameters of the kernel, for example. And uh, things like Gibbs sampling uh, do not work very well. So people came up with very creative ways of doing these joint proposals there, uh, mm. for example. So this is, I think, these are the these problems where and uh, you have this complicated the correlation structure that requires global proposals to have a reasonable accept rate. This is where I think uh, these learned models can be strategically placed. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, great, great. Uh, I think for uh, for this point, probably you can also have a discussion offline because this involves a lot of technical detail. That's cool. Yes. Uh, yes, wonderful. So is there any other question? In the meanwhile, let me just ask a quick question. So um, from my perspective, uh, let's talk about normalizing flows, uh, especially autoregressive flows. So there could be another dimension of the problem. So in some cases, you like the transformation to be simple in some way, right? Right now for normalizing flows, clearly you can just follow any order. So do you have yes. any idea how we may introduce the, uh, the some kind of proper measure of complexity, uh, complexity uh, of the transformation in, when we construct flows so that we can really mimic the true generating process? Yes. Yeah, so this, this particular applications that I'm talking about, uh, uh, the generative process, the, the flows are, are as close as they can get already in terms of the dependency structure, because these are things, these are data that live uh, in kind of some kind of grid on top of a manifold. So it's like a covenant kind of structures already capturing this. But I think you're absolutely right. So if, if you're talking about other kinds of data where there is a no, like basically there's a no dependency, conditional dependency structure, uh, I think we should just incorporate that into the, uh, into the model directly. And uh, we can do that with this autoregressive flows quite easily. Uh, if the dependency structure is no, we can, incorporated this dependency there uh, as well. This is uh, also another theme uh, that I think is very important for other applications where uh, this the causality aspect is not as, as simple as in the like, fundamental physics where things are depend on the near, their neighbors, but a modern, more, more, more uh, data with more high level structure where you know that some things depend on others, but not on, on, all, exactly. on everything else. And uh, I think it's also a uh, very important to uh, consider when building these models. So. Wonderful. Oh, thank you very much. Actually, yes. Uh, let me see. I have a question. Any... Oh, okay. Please. Hi. Yeah. Thanks, Daniel, for the talk. So I have a question. You had a slide about uh, equivalent convolution neural networks, and sort of like uh, you consider the sphere, and you said. We, don't, we cannot really achieve the equivalence and invariance by default because we don't really want, we don't really know how to slide the convolution or such a manifold, right? And sort of like, I have two questions. The first question is why we are talking specifically about the sphere here, which sort of like turns out not to be a sphere, but like approximation of the sphere after you apply the strip. And sort of like, why do I even want to slide the convolution or arbitrary manifolds? Like when, when it can be useful and sort of what, what about the, the extension of this work to other manifolds? Yes, yeah, so this is a very good question. So the sphere here was just an example, but a very concrete uh, problem where the sphere appears is you're doing a weather data prediction, right? The earth uh, is a sphere and you have to put a, uh, use covenants there to uh, make weather forecast, for example. Now uh, you can build uh, convolutions on a sphere that uh, preserve the, the uh, translation equivalence that respect the structure of the sphere and when you do translations or rotations there. So, but uh, you're right that a sphere is a very simple uh, manifold. So in computer graphics, uh, it's probably where they deal with the most complicated manifolds. Right? So uh, if you don't do, uh, there are a few papers where uh, you want to apply some covenant to some complicated manifold, or I don't know, some 3D or complicated 3D object either to do some operation at the manifold itself, uh, like some smoothing or, or do some classification of that. They want to know what, which animal is that, what animal is that. So there are various papers on the computer graphics literature uh, working on the exactly same topic of the equivalence in the convnets or the neural nets for this particular problem with completely generic manifolds there. And in physics, the manifolds are not set up by us, but the physics tell us where the data lives. So, for example, let's say you're modeling a molecule, right? A molecule is described by the position of the atoms, uh, or uh, depending on how you formulate it, uh, it's described by the angles in between the links in the molecule. And uh, so now you have this 
position embedded in space or this angle space where you want to model things. And, uh, the, uh, and uh, if you, that's the problem you're trying to solve. So you're forced to work on these constraints. So this is a, like a given, a manifold that's given to you. So you have to uh, account for this uh, manifold constraint and what are the implications for the covariance there. In the, pro in the problem that I mentioned in our uh, last papers for physics, this manifold uh, is, a bit, uh, is a lot more abstract to explain. So it's a, it's a product of unitary uh, matrices. So the, the data is a bunch of uh, unitary, uh, special unitary matrices. So the manifold is this super complicated uh, uh, manifold uh, that, uh, that uh, so you have the space-time manifold, which is just R4, uh, uh, roughly speaking, it's just R, but at each point you have this complicated uh, complex matrices objects and uh, we have to deal with that because that's where, where all the constraint of the problem. Uh, so when you're talking about images, for example, uh, I think a working hypothesis of a lot of people is that images do live in a very low dimensional manifold that's not the manifold of the Rn on the pixels, right? Uh, but there we tend to ignore it or try to go around this issue with other ways. Um, but um, yeah, that's, that's the point. I think so. This manifold part aspect and uh, the requirements to work on that comes from the th the problem you're trying to solve. So that's imposed to us uh, by the, these problems. Okay, uh, great. Oh, thank you very much. Actually, uh, now it's a uh, time. Uh, uh, thank you very much for sharing with us, uh, Danilo, and uh, thank you for being here. So let's just thank, thank you very much. Speak. Yeah, thanks to thank our speaker. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, see you next time. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the questions.